Well, we couldn't come to the waterfront in San Diego without providing an opportunity to tour the USS Midway. And as a special treat, I'm pleased to introduce someone who actually flew combat missions from the deck of that Midway in Vietnam. After he did flew combat missions, he also was called to become a Blue Angel in the Navy's premier demonstration team and did that for two years. And so he's a distinguished aviator, but he's much more than that to me because he's also married to my mom's sister. So he's my uncle. And so I'd like you to welcome former Naval aviator and my uncle, Jim Horsley. Good morning. I can hardly wait to get that chip in my brain. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be a great day around our household, I'm telling you that. I'm sure my wife is going to be praying for that as well. Let's see if we can get some slides going here. Where am I looking here, Darren? There we go. Well, it's great to be with you. This is way out of my uh, arena of operations at this age and stage in my life. And I wear this flight jacket uh, twice a year. Usually it's just once a year for Veterans Day, and this year it's twice, once for this occasion. So I thought, you know, I, I've got all these patches. They were sitting in a drawer for a number of years, and I thought I probably ought to put them on a jacket. And I know this is your last uh, event of the morning, and uh, I think for the conference, if I'm not mistaken, other than the tour. So I'll keep my remarks brief with the, uh, the idea that for those that go on the tour, I'm happy to answer questions or anything you have. I don't want to interfere with what the docent's going to have to say to you, I'm sure. They'll do a great job in touring you around, but uh, the Midway's got a lot of special meaning for me and for my wife. Uh, we uh, spent 12 years in the Navy, and uh, the last uh, couple of years with the Blue Angels, as Darren mentioned, and uh, it was a great experience for us, but uh, coming back to San Diego, it pushes all the buttons for me. You know, my life is not as an aviator. It's not my identity. I'll mention a little bit of that towards the end. Uh, but we went across the street last night to the Kansas City barbecue, which, by the way, the brisket was terrific. Uh, but it's, it's just covered with pictures of Tom Cruise and Top Gun from 1986. And uh, the Top Gun guys didn't qualify to fly for the Blue Angels, so I just thought I'd throw that out there. <laughs> they would never believe that, but uh, it's fun to be back here. We woke up this morning the sound of the jet engines and the airplanes taking off from Coronado and the Nimitz pulled in yesterday afternoon. I think they just came out of the yards in Bremerton. And in reality, that's about as much as I know about the current Navy. I'm not a part of it. I've been out, uh, out of the Navy, as I mentioned, only 12 years. So but it's great to be back here. And uh, uh, Sony and I are delighted to be back in San Diego and, and share a few moments with you. Uh, my first experience was the Midway was uh, with my squadron, VA-115, and I only wear this hat a couple times a year as well. But uh, early in 1972, we came to San Diego with the airplanes when Miramar was a naval air station, and we flew out to the Midway, which had come down from San Francisco to start what we thought was about six weeks of training and carrier operations with the whole air wing. And as we went, flew out to the ship, we landed for our first uh, practice, takeoff and landing, and they trapped us aboard and taxied us forward and shut us down. And as soon as they had all the airplanes recovered aboard, it turned around and went back to San Francisco, and three days later, we steamed for Vietnam. And the slide you see up there is uh, going under the Golden Gate Bridge, and a couple of guys in that slide did not come home. And uh, it was uh, maybe a, a, an armed conflict for the country, but for the guys... The crew that on the Midway and in our squadron, it was, a, it was a war. And we were there 11 months, longest period of any aircraft carrier in the war uh, at that point in time. And um, it was a difficult time. Then they sh we came back from, uh, and I'll cover a little bit about that in a minute, but we came back from that 11-month cruise, changed out all of our airplanes, and you talk about change in an environment. Uh, the Midway was then designated as the home port carrier for Yakuska, Japan. And uh, they wanted a constant presence carriers in the, in, the, in the Far East. And so we actually flew an A-6 with their airplanes all the way to Yakuska, Japan, flew, landed at Atsugi, and were there about nine months. And then my third tour on the Midway was as an admiral's aide, and we were in the Persian Gulf uh, when the U.S. was still friendly with Iran and uh, did a war at sea exercise with a number of uh, different countries from around the world in the Persian Gulf. So a lot of experience on the Midway. The great thing about that ship 
compared to most carriers that really great air conditioning and pretty decent food. And uh, although we never got a good night's sleep with the catapults always firing, uh, uh, it, it got dark inside when you turned the lights off. And you'll see that as you tour around today. So I tricked this photo up a little bit by putting the datum lights in there and then the green, green horizontal lights there and then the orange ball. When you're lined up on glide slope on a night carrier approach, uh, and this is illuminated a lot more than it would be, uh, that's the sight picture you'd like to have when you land on that carrier. And I've, I've got about 300 landings on that carrier. Uh, I had to, would have had to extend my tour with the squadron in Japan to get to 100 landings, and I decided I didn't want to do that. <laughs> Every night landing was really pretty excruciating. Uh, the catapults could be a lot of fun in the daytime, uh, really an e-ticket ride. Uh, the night operations around a carrier was really an experience, and I don't know that of anything I've seen in my entire life, I don't think there's ever been a, 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 a circumstance that equals what happens with flight deck operations on an aircraft carrier, particularly in combat and war. Uh, ordnance being loaded on airplanes, airplanes being fueled, crews pre-flighting airplanes, engines starting, airplanes taxing, uh, everybody's got a different color flight deck jersey depending on what their job is. And then they start banging these airplanes and you go from a standing start on the catapult to airborne in about two seconds and you go from zero to about 160 knots. At night, all the pitot static instruments lag and so you just let the stick come back in your lap and grab it because you know that's the right position. Take a big breath and as soon as you've seen the altimeter start to come up, then you can bring up the landing gear. <laughs> and then the flaps, try and catch your breath at night and away you go and then the, all you have to do is fly your mission over North Vietnam and service air missiles. It was really quite an experience. <laughs> Best thing in my aviation resume is I have equal numbers of takeoffs and landings. And uh, I, I, think, I think that's a, a great attribute. Uh, Churchill said there's nothing quite as exhilarating as being shot at without effect. And he was absolutely right. And I've been shot at a lot, uh, picked up some fragments from surface air missiles, but nothing that hit the airplane. Uh, but it wasn't necessarily the, the story for the rest of the guys in my squadron. My first mission over North Vietnam Daylight, we did every, we briefed all the way as the midway cruise from Alameda to uh, the, the Gulf of Tonkin. The experienced guys trained us all the way over, probably for five weeks. And we got over there, and my first mission was flying wing on a guy in his right wing, and we hadn't been across the beach in North Vietnam for more than a half a second, and his whole right wing went up in a fireball. I'll tell you the rest of the story on the tour. I guess for you guys who are leaving, I'll tell you that we did survive it. But what happened was when I saw his airplane go up in flames, I broke right to avoid it. And when I turned back to left, I couldn't see him, and I thought he had flown into the ground because I saw smoke coming up from the beach. Called in the search and rescue uh, crews, and I headed back to the ship, and in a few minutes, my navigator got him on the radio. And what we had seen hit the ground was his bombs that he jettisoned when he was hit. And the shell had come through his right wing tip, vaporized the fuel, remaining fuel in that wing, and uh, that's what I saw. I caught up with him, he had a hole about three foot big in his wingtip, and uh, he was able to land aboard the ship in the barricade. That was my first mission. <laughs> I was there 11 months, had a couple hundred missions, uh, so it, uh, it went downhill from there. We were there during uh, the period of time uh, when Nixon was really with Kissinger trying to end the war, but they started that with a really serious mining effort in Haiphong as part of the linebacker one and two operations. That was in May of 1972, that's a long time ago. Uh, war hasn't changed much uh, since those days, but that, that period of time ended for us during the Christmas bombings in 1972 when Kissinger was finally able to get the North Vietnamese in Paris to capitulate, and uh, the, uh, we had a lot of losses during that period. My first roommate, uh, Ray Donnelly, um, was killed. Uh, then uh, we had another crew. He had a flight deck accident at night on the midway, and um, it... Uh, the navigator ejected over the side, and uh, so it was a tough period uh, for us for losses. So the Midway has a different meaning for me than tourists as a museum. Uh, it wasn't until uh, really early 2000s that we had a reunion for the first time for our squadron, so almost 30 years. The reason for that reunion was that they found the remains of my roommate, Al Clark, in a uh, museum in North Vietnam through DNA testing on a helmet they had discovered. And so we had our first rendezvous at Arlington in uh, 2002, and I hadn't seen these guys for 30 years. I don't know how they got so old, why I'd stayed so young. Uh, my navigator showed up with the maps and uh, 
Sonia and I laugh every time Sonia's in the back. She's been with me for 54 years and put up with a lot of this stuff. I'm so grateful my life would have no meaning without her in it. And uh, she went through all of this as a wife uh, while we had the squadron. But uh, my navigator, every time I see him, runs up, kisses me, thanks me for saving his life. <laughs> it's really pretty hysterical. And we're, we're still very close. He's back in the Oceana area. Um, our second reunion was on the Midway as a squadron. And then the last reunion we had was on the Midway a few years ago. And if you tour the flight deck today, you'll see an A6 and the names uh, Arlo Clark and Mike McCormick stenciled on the, ca on the airplane canopy rail. Those are my two roommates, the last guys lost in Vietnam War. When we toured that with, ship with Sonia, one of the first ready rooms they restored on the ship was the ready room five, which was our ready room, the A6 ready room. And when Sonia walked into that room with a couple other wives, they just burst into tears because for 11 months, all they got were letters, uh, the, no text, no cell, no social media. And uh, they had no context for what we had gone through. And of course, we had no context for what our wives went through. So uh, the Midway is really a special place for us, but it's not the ship. It's the crew that was on the ship. It's just a piece of big metal. I just noticed that two carriers uh, were just sold for a penny each just for salvage purposes. So there's not a lot of value in the ship itself, but in the crew that served on it. And um, I had a tour uh, as an Admiral's aide, as I mentioned, then I ended up in Pensacola as a flight instructor and had the quickest transition to Blue Angels in history because I was in the same hangar and I uh, chased the blues, it's like kind of being chasing a fraternity to a degree. You have to have the experience and the qualifications and the endorsement. But they have to get to know you during the air show season, and we got acquainted, and I got selected uh, in, uh, uh, back in 1979 to fly uh, in the left wing with the Blue Angels. They were flying A4s at the time. Here we go. And... Uh, the, uh, the experience was unbelievable. My transition was the quickest in history. I walked across the hangar. The blues are on the road. There was a chief upstairs said, hey, there are blue flight suits in the locker room. Go grab one that fits. Put one on. I walked into the, the office, and he said, the spare airplane's down on the line. Go for a flight. And that was it. I'd been flying A4, so it was a no-brainer to fly the airplane. And then for two years, I flew with the blues. Uh, first year, number three on the left wing, and then number... My second year was in the slot, and that's the view I had really as a safety pilot for the formation. Flying about 18 maneuvers in an air show at, at speeds as 450 knots and altitudes as low as 100 feet. And I would say that uh, it was really a pursuit of perfection flying with the Blue Angels. It's all in the practice. Now, if you look at me, uh, don't look at me as a guy that has unbelievable ability that got, managed to get selected. My whole life, I'm guessing, is a lot like yours. You have to love what you do, and you have to work really hard to make something happen. And that's been my whole experience. I never got anything right the first time for the, for the most part. It was always, but if I was given a chance to practice, I could get consistently really good, mostly because I just loved what I did. And I loved the smell of jet fuel. I loved everything about jet airplanes. Uh, but that was really the secret. And uh, how are we doing on time, Darren? You want to wrap it up? We've got a couple more minutes. I'll tell you a quick story. So my first experience flying with the Blue Angels, they stick me in the back seat of the two-seater Blue Angel with number four, and the way the Blue Angels taxi out is two airplanes go out together, separate a little bit, so we taxi out six airplanes. And I'm in the back seat of the second section of airplanes, and uh, my pilot's job is to join up on taxi out on the airplane ahead of him. And as we turn into position on the taxi out, I says, there's no way they can do this and not hit an airplane. And uh, I'd been around airplanes, I had a lot of experience, combat and carrier and everything. And uh, I'm seeing sight pictures I have never seen in airplanes before while they're moving. And uh, we taxi out, and as we turn to the approach end of the, the runway, we turn, and sure enough, the, the pilot I'm riding with, Bruce Davey, number four, clips the tail of the airplane in front of him. He comes up on the radio and says, Tag, I got you first. <laughs> I'm <laughs> thinking, who are these guys? <laughs> and we got airborne, and uh, it was an unbelievable experience flying with the Blue Angels. 36 inches wingtip to canopy. So that's the distance. For the first year I was on the left wing, I got no vote. I was just told to shut up, stay in position, we'll let you know if anything changes. And it was all choreographed, so I knew where I needed to be and what the voice calls were. And everything was predicated by a voice call and the things that the Blue Angels did. 
nothing was uh, to follow the flight leader. So if the flight leader, for example, said, up we go for a loop, at the P of up, we all start pulling our stick back. And if he didn't pull his stick back, we were going to go above him. So that was where all the practice was, was just getting that all synchronized and that anticipation and the timing. It was just really extraordinary experience to do that. Uh, but as I said, the pursuit of perfection, we never flew the perfect air show. Came pretty close, I think the closest at the academy my second year on the team. But even then, number, the number two pilot, a Marine who lives up in Mission Viejo, he still resents the idea that I had to throw him out of the formation because he was late on a rendezvous. And <laughs> Tim Denane. And, uh, but uh, my first year on the team, uh, this pursuit of perfection, uh, we were doing a changeover roll, and without getting too many details, we inverted with four airplanes stacked down on the right. As we got to about here at about 4,500 4, feet, got a voice call to go diamond, and as I added power and started to slide across the formation, I hit the guy in front of me because I added too much power. And then he hit the guy in front of him, the flight leader, and I tumbled out of the formation. So I'm, I'm 90 degrees nose down, airplane shaking like a cement mixer, and uh, I'm thinking I gotta get out of this airplane before it hits the desert floor. We had a practice area about 30 miles outside of El Centro. And as I mentioned, equal numbers and takeoffs and landings, it's an unnatural act for a pilot to want to get out of an airplane he took off in. And I, my last move was to pull that stick back and the airplane actually responded enough and I bottomed out. And I have no idea how close to the ground I came, maybe a couple hundred feet. Pull the nose back up to about a thousand feet and I headed for the airport 30 miles away. As I'm getting close to the airport, the number four pilot who watched all of this from behind joined up with me and uh, gave me a visual check out and he said, don't fly over the town of Brawley on your approach. I says, Mike, I've got to get the airplane on the ground. It's not handling well. He says, it's going to get worse. And about that time, four feet of my right wingtip fell off. Well, you can cross control on an airplane with some control surfaces, even though there's stubby little wings on A4s. And I managed to get this airplane on the ground and, um, and uh, taxied back in as if nothing happened. And the crew chief's eyes got about that big. Uh, the pilot the year before I'd taxied out with my first flight was still in Pensacola because he had left the Navy and his well intentions were to go over and tell my wife not to worry I was okay but he carried a Bible and showed up at the front door and you can imagine with a military background what it's like to have unexpected visitors with a Bible show up at your front door. We were okay and we had a spare airplane and an hour later after debriefing and calming our nerves we got back in and flew that maneuver. Um, that's a good example of how life works I think in reality. We can pour our whole lives into something. I know that you probably work harder than you've ever worked in your life in this economy to make something happen when it's just so difficult to think you can affect change. And uh, it's that you've poured your life, your resources, your family into making something happen. And what doesn't work, what are you left with? So I wrote this book called A Different Kind of Courage back in uh, 1998. It's well over 20 years old, but it was essentially the movement of of recognizing that who I was in that blue angel cockpit was what, not who I was on the inside. It was really about a journey to faith and the book describes a number of key friends in Seattle as to how faith made a difference in their life. Uh, it's been a monumental change in my life. My, my identity is not as a blue angel or as an aviator. I'm convinced if I wore a blue angel flight suit for a day, I'd be known for a blue angel as for a lifetime. I do oil painting right now, and uh, I could paint a 1,000 paintings, and nobody's ever going to call me an artist. They're going to call me an aviator. But that's not who I am. And I would encourage all of you that uh, uh, we're in a culture and a society that is in the take mode. Get what you can get at whatever expense that may take to grab it. And it's been my life experience, and my guess, because of your backgrounds and your commitment, that's where you are. As you know, it's not in the taking, it's the contributing. So I would just encourage you, thank you for everything that you pour into your industry for the benefit of our country. Without you, we don't have one. I don't care what the military does or anybody else. Without the products and service that you provide, we have nothing left. And um, I would just say, and, and I'll look forward to visiting with you over lunch and uh, on the midway, but the, uh, the really the fulfillment is in the fulfilling. And God bless each and every one of you. Thanks so much.